Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the latest and greatest news with regards to recent successful space flight events, a guide to the following week's worth of planned rocket launches, and a summary of all the best historical anniversaries relating to space flight set to take place over the next seven days. We've got lots to discuss, from thwarted spaceship hijackings to gnomes flying from Middle Earth and to dragons grabbing onto space stations, so I do hope you enjoy the following images. Before we get started, good and proper though, do make sure you're subscribed by hitting that little red button and bell down below to ensure that you get notified of these videos as soon as they're live, so that the news you receive is as up-to-date and relevant as possible. But let us put off starting the show no longer and move on to our first segment, all of the launches and spaceflight events that we saw happen last week. First up, we hoped to see Virgin fly their reusable space plane VSS Unity on a suborbital flight between the 19th and 23rd of November. However, the company later announced that they would be rescheduling the flight entirely due to concerns of COVID-19, which is unsurprising really, as the flight would have taken place in New Mexico, which is currently in a statewide lockdown to try and reduce the spread of the virus. I'm happy to see that Virgin have chosen worker safety over flight, and hopefully it won't be too long before things clear up and we get to see them take another shot at launching. On Monday the 16th, we found out that Crew Dragon's Zero-G indicator was a cuddly baby Yoda. While this was very cute at first, things got a bit scary when he suddenly made a dash for pilot Victor Glover's seat in an attempt to hijack the dragon. Luckily, the force was not with him, and the next day, on November the 17th, Dragon made it to the International Space Station unscathed and successfully docked with the Harmony module. On a slightly sadder note on the same day, we unfortunately saw the loss of Ariane Space's Vega mission. The launch started off very well, with the first three stages working as intended, but then, approximately eight minutes after liftoff and immediately following fourth stage ignition, the rocket experienced a degradation of trajectory. The underperformance of the fourth stage burn led to sub-nominal speed, and Ariane Space CEO Stefan Israel confirmed that the mission was lost, with loss of both satellite payloads. These were two Earth observation satellites, one for the French Space Agency, and the other for the Spanish Earth Observation Satellite Project. This marks the second Vega rocket launch failure in the past 16 months, so hopefully the issue can be figured out for this historically fairly reliable rocket. Out of its 17 missions so far, only two have been lost. We had two successful suborbital flights from the US Missile Defense Agency on the 17th as well. This was a test of ICBM interception. The first launch was at 5.50 a.m. and was an ICBM T2 from the Ronald Reagan Ballistic Missile Defense Test Site. The second launch was an SM-3 missile launched by the US Navy from the USS John Finn, which successfully encountered and destroyed the first missile, proving the ability for the SM-3 block. 2A missile to intercept an intercontinental ballistic missile target. The 18th of November saw the first use of the Poisk module airlock on the International Space Station in 11 years. This was to allow cosmonauts Sergei Rizivok and Sergei Kudsverchkov to conduct a spacewalk on which they conducted some works on preparing the decommissioning and departure of the Piers module as well as relocating an antenna and repositioning instruments. The 20th of November brought the most exciting launch of the week in my opinion. Yes, this was Rocket Lab's return to sender Electron mission. The Electron rockets took flight from the BEA Utiful Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, carrying an impressive 30 satellites for customers in the US, New Zealand and France, each bound for unique orbits, using Electron's kick stage space tug to reach each of their particular destinations. Between them, these satellites will enable internet from space, test new methods of deorbiting space debris and enable earthquake prediction research. I think I can speak for everyone though in saying that the best passenger of the Electron was Noam Chomsky a 3D printed version of the gnome from Half-Life 2 Episode 2, who is infamous for earning the player the achievement Little Rocket Man, which requires the player to carry out the very difficult task of carrying the little gnome through the game to the final location before placing him on a rocket and sending him to space. And now, 13 years after the game released, the little fella finally got to ride into space for real. This was a mass simulator payload and was on behalf of Valve President Gabe Newell to help raise money for Starship Children's Hospital. Impressive and exciting as the payloads were though, the coolest aspect of this mission was the fate of the first stage which, rather than simply being expended, deployed a parachute and safely splashed down in the ocean, where it was recovered for study by Rocket Lab to assess how the booster holds up after use, this being the first 
major step for Rocket Lab in making the Electron rocket partially reusable, similar to SpaceX's Falcon 9. And speaking of SpaceX, CEO Elon Musk offered his congratulations to Rocket Lab on Twitter. Always nice to see that competition in the crazy world of rockets remains friendly. Rocket Lab eventually hoped to catch the falling Electron first stage mid-air with a helicopter, a capability they've already proven with a dummy test, but right now the objective is to simply recover and thoroughly examine the spent booster to look for any ways in which it needs to be modified or improved upon to help facilitate reuse. Exciting times, and I can't wait for the day we finally get to see the reflight of an Electron first stage. The next flight of the week took place on the 21st of November and was the successful launch of a Falcon 9 from the Vandenberg Satellite Launch Complex. On board was a Sentinel-6A Michael Freelick satellite, which is named after American oceanographer and former director of the NASA Earth Science Division, Michael Freelick, who sadly passed away in August this year. The satellite was developed jointly by European and American agencies and will use a suite of onboard instruments to study ocean surface elevation data i.e. sea level changes, as well as measure atmospheric temperature profile data as a secondary objective. The Falcon 9's first stage booster returned to mainland for a successful touchdown at Landing Zone 4 shortly after liftoff, which brought a close to the first ever flight of this particular booster, but hopefully it won't be the last. Now that's it for all the launches we saw last week, so now it's time to moosey on down to Boca Chica, Texas to take a gander at how SpaceX's Starship development is going. Not many major events took place last week, just business as usual, with Starship SN8-15 to all actively being worked on, with the SN8 undergoing engine repairs after its most recent static fire test ended with some damage to its underside, with one of the engines needing to be removed and replaced entirely. Elon Musk confirmed the cause of the mishap on Twitter, stating that the martite surface that covers the concrete ground below the rocket shattered, throwing up blades of hardened rock into the engine bay. Martite is used as a thermal protection layer to shield the concrete from the extreme heat of the Raptor's fire. The shattering of this was therefore not likely to be due to the thermal forces of the engine, but rather the massive vibrations generated by the roaring starship. The extreme vibrations of launch vehicles is a very real issue that engineers need to account for when launching large rockets. One of the most common ways of suppressing the shockwaves is by pumping huge volumes of water across the launch pad and launch platform during liftoff, which is something that you can see in this video here during a test of the system at pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. There's also the Russian approach of just digging a massive hole underneath the rocket. The fact that this was a launch pad issue is good news though, as it means that the damage to the Starship wasn't caused by a design flaw with the engine or vehicle itself, so the vehicle's 15 km flight may not be quite so far away as we first feared. As for the other Starship prototypes, you can follow their process by following Brendan Lewis on Twitter. He routinely publishes these excellent renders, showing the real-time status of each Starship and Super Heavy prototype, so you can easily keep track of the status of these vehicles. I also need to give an obligatory thanks to Austin Barnard, who routinely provides us with excellent photo and video from the Boca Chica site, including this awesome shot of the SN9 rolled out of the high bay. But that's it for all the best stuff that took place last week, so now it's time to take a look into the future at this week's set of launches. But before we do that, I've got to real shamelessly ask that if you're enjoying this video so far guys, then please do leave a little like down below to help us out. It costs nothing but helps the channel out immensely. Anyway, with that, let's look ahead to the future. The first two launches planned for this week may have already happened since they're set to take place around two hours before I plan to upload this video and guys I do need a bit more advance notice to get these edited and uploaded. Uh, the first is another SpaceX Starlink launch which as always will be flying on a trusty Falcon 9. This is a fairly big flight though. This will not only be the 100th flight of a Falcon 9 rocket but this will also be the first time SpaceX have used the same first stage booster for the seventh time. If all goes to plan, the first stage will touch down on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship shortly after launch, with the 60 Starlink satellites expected to deploy about an hour after liftoff. SpaceX plan on catching one of the fairing halves in one of their massive fairing catcher nets and plan to recover the other half from the water. Starlink is a fairly frequently recurring topic on this channel due to the high frequency of launches, but if you're new to this sort of news, then Starlink is SpaceX's mega constellation with which they hope to provide high-speed satellite internet on a near global scale. This latest batch of satellites will definitely help contribute towards this goal and it's always fun watching Falcon 9's launch and land. 
The next flight planned for the early hours of today is a Chinese Long March 5, carrying the Chang'e 5 robotic lunar lander, which if all goes to plan will conduct China's first lunar sample return mission. Very exciting stuff. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about Chinese launches since using footage of them usually results in so moving on, our next launch will be a Soyuz 2.1, launching from the Plesetska launch site on the 24th of November. On board will be three Russian GONET M satellites, which will join the GONET satellite constellation, which is a Russian communications satellite system. Soyuz is one of the most reliable rockets out there, so I'm optimistic that this launch will proceed nominally. The next launch is another Russian one, this time an Angara A5. This will be on the 28th of November and will be the second ever flight of the Angara A5 rocket, which will just be carrying a test payload. The Angara class of rockets are still very much in development and will eventually replace Russia's Proton launch system. The A5 has a payload capacity of 24.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit, almost a whole ton more than Proton and only around 4.5 tons less than the massive Delta IV Heavy. Here's hoping the launch is a success. On November 29th, we'll see another Russian rocket. This time it's another Soyuz operated by Ariane Space, launching from the Guiana Space Center in South America. On board will be a Falcon I-2 reconnaissance satellite for the United Arab Emirates Armed Forces. Our final launch of the week will also be taking place on Sunday the 29th and will be the launch of the Japanese H-2A rocket from the beautiful Tanegashima launch site. On board will be a Japanese optical data relay satellite. Here's to your success, H2A. But that's the final launch of the week, and so now it's time to move along to our final segment of the show, all the best historical anniversary set to take place over the next seven days. Our first space anniversary takes place today, November the 23rd, in 1963, when the BBC broadcasts An Unearthly Child, starring William Hartnell. This was the first ever episode of the first ever series of Doctor Who, which is now the world's longest running science fiction drama. I know it's not strictly space fight related news, but given that sci-fi audiences and space nerds are pretty much the same group of people, I thought it might be nice to include this anniversary in today's history segment. Here's to you, Doctor... what was your name again? <laughs> okay, that was terrible. Moving on, we have a real spaceflight anniversary on the same day in 1972, when the Soviet Union made its final attempt at launching the massive N1 moon rocket. Since viewers of this show know that the Saturn V is the only rocket capable of sending humans to the moon, it's not hard to guess how successful this flight went. The gigantic N1 launched off the pad successfully at first, but around 90 seconds later the fuel lines to the core propulsion system burst, the boat tail of the rocket caught fire, and the number 4 engine exploded. The first stage disintegrated 107 seconds into the flight. Happily, the launch escape system successfully pulled the Soyuz capsule away from the doomed rocket, although the rocket was uncrewed so it didn't really matter a great deal. This would be the longest ever flight of the N1 and sadly would also be the final ever flight of the N1. I've always had a soft spot for the N1 rocket, maybe I just love a good underdog story. On the 23rd of November again, but this time in 2015, Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket became the first ever rocket to successfully fly to space and then return to Earth for controlled vertical landing. SpaceX's Falcon 9 wouldn't make its first landing until the 22nd of December in 2015, although it is worth remembering that the Falcon 9 is an orbital class rocket, while the New Shepard is suborbital. Still, it was an impressive achievement nonetheless, and the booster would end up being refueled and reflown back to space, netting Blue Origin the second achievement of being the first company to refly the same booster back to space. The next day, on November the 24th in 1969, the Apollo 12 command module successfully splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, bringing an end to the second manned mission to the surface of the moon. We've discussed Apollo 12 steps over the last couple of episodes of Space This Week, so I thought it might be nice to just acknowledge this mission's conclusion in today's episode. On November the 26th in 1965, France launched the Asterix satellite aboard a Diamond A rocket and in doing so became the third nation to successfully place an object in orbit using its own booster. The Asterix satellite remains in orbit to this day and, due to the relatively high altitude of its orbit, it's expected to stay there for several centuries. 
The same day, in 2011, the Mars Science Laboratory was launched by NASA aboard an Atlas V rocket. Many of you will know this mission as the Curiosity mission, as the spacecraft contained the Curiosity rover, which was successfully landed on the Red Planet in August the following year. Due to the much higher mass of the Curiosity rover compared with previously landed rovers, unpowered descent wouldn't be possible, so NASA employed a sky crane system, something that had never been used before, to slowly lower the rover to the surface of the planet before flying away and crash landing around 650 meters away. Curiosity continues to roam the surface of Mars to this day, still going strong after 3,030 Earth days on the surface. Curiosity's rover design served as the basis for NASA's 2021 Perseverance mission, which is a rover of similar appearance but which carries different scientific instruments. The same day, seven years later, in 2018, we have another robotic Mars landing. This time, it's the InSight lander mission, which touched down at the Elysium Polynesia on Mars around six months after launch. InSight's mission objective is to study the deep interior of Mars, using various onboard gizmos including a seismometer, which can be used to create an accurate 3D map of the planet's interior, as well as a heat flow probe that burrows 5 meters down into the Martian surface while trailing a heat-sensitive tether to study the thermal properties of Mars's interior. Friday the 27th of November will mark the 1971 anniversary of the day that the Soviet space probe Mars 2 released its Mars Descent module. The module sadly malfunctioned and crashed on the surface of Mars, but it was nonetheless the very first human-made objects to reach the Martian surface. The Soviet Mars 3 probe was launched nine days after the launch of the Mars 2, and its landing module performed things a little bit more successfully. This time, the landing sequence went as planned, and the Mars 3 became the first spacecraft to perform a soft landing on Mars. It sadly failed 110 seconds later, having only been able to transmit one great image with no details. Still, a big achievement nonetheless. Our final anniversary is yet another Martian one, this time taking place on the 28th of November in 1964, which is the day that NASA launched the Mariner 4 probe aboard an Atlas LV-3 rocket. The probe was designed to conduct close-up observations of Mars and performed the first successful flyby of the Red Planet, and in the process returned the first ever images of another planet ever returned from deep space. The photos revealed Mars to be a cratered and seemingly dead world, and measurements revealed a very thin atmosphere, much thinner than expected, painting a picture of a relatively inactive planet exposed to the harshness of space, which generally dissipated hopes of finding intelligent life on Mars. But that ties a little bow on this week's history segment of Space This Week. And with that, another episode of Space This Week is over. Lots of Marsy stuff happening throughout history this week, and of course, history itself was made with the successful docking of the Crew Dragon to the ISS. Congratulations to Victor Glover for thwarting Baby Yoda's hijack attempt, of course. On screen, there should now be some end cards. The left-hand panel is a link to the full Space This Week playlist if you'd like to check out more videos like this one. The right-hand panel is a video auto-generated, chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. Hopefully, it made a good choice. I think I've kind of said my pieces regarding this week's episode of Space This Week, so I'm going to leave it there. Have an excellent week, guys, and I will see you next Monday. <laughs>